Turn with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 11. I'm going to read the whole chapter, verses 1 to 30. And it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed thence to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Art thou he that shall come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said to them, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he whomsoever shall not be offended in me. And as they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, When went you out into the wilderness? What, sorry, what went you out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went you out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what went you out to see? A prophet? Yea, and I say unto you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Verily I say unto you, Among them that are born of women, there hath not arisen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you will receive it, this is Elias, or Elijah, which was for to come. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. But whereunto shall I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in markets, calling unto their fellows and saying, We have piped unto you and have not danced. We have mourned to you and you have not lamented. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a devil. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of her children. Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done, because they repented not. Woe unto thee, Chorazin! Woe unto thee, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in that day of judgment than for thee. At that time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemeth good in thy sight, are all things delivered unto me of my Father. And no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man save the Father, uh, any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Come unto me. All you that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I read quite a bit of scripture there. And I read it for a reason, because it really speaks to what we're going to look at today. I haven't as yet got a title got a title for this message. I thought of one, but it didn't seem very good. So we're just going to leave it at Matthew 11 for now. I think this portion of Scripture, this chapter of Scripture that I read today, is probably one of the strangest and yet most powerful passages of Scripture in the Gospels. 
And I hope you'll see why as we go through. Jesus in the previous chapter, chapter 10, verses 1 to 42, had been instructing and commissioning the 12 disciples to go out on a mission, to go out to preach the gospel. His 12 chosen men were sent out on an evangelistic mission. They were to go out from their base of operation, which was Galilee, in the triangle that we mentioned in the, in the uh, chapter there, Chorazin, Bethsaida and Capernaum. And that will become more important as we go through the message. Remember those three places. They were to go and preach the gospel and to heal the sick. But they were not to go through Samaria. Turn back with me a little to Matthew 10 verse 5 and 6. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. So they were to leave the area, they were to leave that region, and they were to travel down, maybe as far as Jerusalem, down the, the Jordan Valley, maybe taking the same path that Jesus took on that last journey up to Jerusalem, through the Judean wilderness up to Jerusalem. But they were not to go through Samaria, but specifically to the lost sheep of Israel. However, that isn't the important thing I want to bring from this message. Jesus sending the disciples out on this evangelistic mission, although there's a great message in that in itself, maybe several. But that's not what I want to focus on today. It's more what happened after they'd gone that I want to look at today. I wonder how many of you have ever laboured and maybe still labouring to witness to unsaved relatives. How many of you, I wonder, have laboured in prayer over people that you may work with? Colleagues that you may know outside the the Christian circle. Neighbours maybe. Acquaintances that you regularly meet in your walk, in your general life. You may have laboured for years, praying for people, witnessing to members of your family and you seem to get nowhere. Anybody ever been there? Ditto. I have to. Well, this message is going to speak to you, hopefully. There are important lessons for us to learn in this chapter For those of you who seem to be getting nowhere fast with witnessing, especially to relatives, don't you find that relatives can be the hardest people to witness to? Because they know you. They know all your past faults. They know all the little quirks and problems that you had before you were saved. And they hold those things maybe against you, I don't know. But they know you. And that can make witnessing Very difficult, especially to close family. But there are important lessons for us to learn in this passage. I want you first to keep in mind that this particular area in the Galilee, as I said, Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum, was quite important for quite a few of the disciples. And we'll see the importance of that a little later on. The first thing that Jesus does after the twelve have gone, is to go and preach and teach in their cities. Have you noticed that? The first thing he does after he's finished, in fact the first verse of chapter 11 says it for us, and it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed thence to teach and preach in their cities that particular area. Now why did he do that? Why did he send the twelve disciples away? Well, there'd be many reasons to send them away. They had to learn how to be evangelistic in their faith. Yes? They had to learn how to witness. They had to learn how to minister the gospel and to pray for people, even minister healing to people, to see them delivered and so on. But there was another reason too. 
And that's what we're going to get into today. There was something that needed to be done that could only be done with them out of the way. The first thing that Jesus encounters are messengers from John the Baptist. Now this doesn't particularly um, affect those three cities, I don't think, unless some have been there who had heard John the Baptist. But these messengers from John the Baptist come to Jesus and John the Baptist asking if he is the real one, if he's the Messiah, or say they look for someone else. And it's easy to judge John, isn't it? It's easy to, to jump to judgment to John and think, well, why is he so lacking in faith? This man who had been in the wilderness and preaching repentance, salvation for the coming Messiah, baptizing people, preparing the way for the Lord to come. And here he is asking, are you the one? Or should we look for another? But we really need to remember something that was on John's mind. And it comes from something that he himself said. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5, verses 3 to 12. Matthew, did I say Matthew 5? I did, sorry. Matthew 3, verses 5. I apologise. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around about Jordan and were baptised of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Bring forth therefore fruits to meet, meet for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children to Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which brings forth not fruit, not forth fruit, good fruit, is hewn down and cast into the fire. I indeed baptise you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me, and take note here, is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not able to bear, worthy to bear. He shall baptise you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Verse 12, this is important. Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now what do you think was in the mind of John the Baptist there? Was it Yeshua ben Yosef? Jesus, son of Joseph, suffering servant? Or was it Yeshua ben David, conquering king? And because Jesus had him fulfilled that part of prophecy. He hadn't come ridding Israel of the Romans. He hadn't come cleansing his threshing floor with unquenchable fire. Doubt came into John's mind. Are you the one? Or do we look for another? He had the right prophecy, but he had the wrong coming, didn't he? And so we shouldn't be quick to judge John. He knew the prophecy. It just hadn't been revealed to him in what form Jesus would come in his first coming. But Jesus sensed him reassuring words of encouragement. The blind see. The dead are raised to life. The sick are healed. Don't worry, John. I am he. Jesus encourages him. But then... However, Jesus turns to the people of the area, the people who were there round about him, and he berates them for their fickleness. Their fickleness. Look at verse 16 and 17 of uh, chapter 11. 
For whereunto shall I liken this generation? It's like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows and saying, We've piped unto you and you have not danced. We have mourned unto you and you have not lamented. Do you know they used to hire professional mourners at Jewish funerals? Did you know that? And they would mourn professionally. They'd make wailing and weeping, terrible, loud, soulful sounds just to amplify the occasion. But Jesus was saying to them, you are like these people. You've had the Son of God in your midst doing wonders, doing miracles, feeding the 5,000, healing the sick, raising dead, bringing sight to the blind. And yet you've been completely unmoved. They've been unmoved even by the Messiah himself. And this is just the beginning of what Jesus does in this chapter. Jesus, they'd accused of having a demon. Uh, Sorry, John, they'd accused of having a demon. Verse 18. For John came neither eating nor drinking. And they say, that's the people in the area, he has a demon. He has a devil. And Jesus himself, the son of man, came eating and drinking. And they say, behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But Jesus says, wisdom is justified of her children. He berates them heavily. Jesus himself, they accused. They were happy with the status quo. They were happy with the way things are. They didn't want to be unsettled, did they? Even though, as we'll see in a moment, many of those 12 disciples were from this area. And Jesus himself had made it his headquarters, his mission headquarters. But Jesus starts then to bring some home truths. And this is where... I hope you'll see as we go through this message that Jesus is showing us the work before the crucifixion of the Holy Spirit after the crucifixion. And I hope that you'll see the relevance of that when we get to the end. Jesus is doing something while these 12 are away that couldn't be done while they were there. He's bringing a conviction is bringing a challenge that only can't come from God to the hearts and minds of people who are insensitive. Jesus brings home truth to the people. He speaks of the mighty works that were done by him. And that word mighty works there is the Greek word dunamis, Dunamis, or dunamis. And it's miracles. Jesus had performed many miracles in this area. In front of these people. But for which mighty works are these people being rebuked, chastised? Let's take a look. The cities that Jesus has chosen here, as as I've said, Chorazim, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. And I'm going to read out some of the miracles that were done there to give you an idea of why Jesus was chastising them in such a severe way. And this had to be done with the disciples out of the way because this was their home. These, many of them were their relatives and friends. But first of all, we have Chorazim. Chorazim means the secret. Here is a mystery. That's what the name means. Not much is known about Chorazim. It was founded in the first century, just before the time of Jesus, actually. And not much is known of it. It was founded in the first century, and in the Talmud it's noted as a place that grew good wheat. 
What a glowing endorsement of a city. It's a place that grew good wheat. But this is the only place that it's mentioned in Scripture, here and in Luke, covering the same, um, same event, the same occasion. Not much is known about it, and if you go there now, it doesn't exist. It's a heap of rubble. Not even one stone upon another. Black basalt rocks. Has anybody ever been there? There's nothing there. There used to be. But we don't know why Jesus picked that particular place, but it was one of the three that were important at that time. The, the second one is Bethsaida, or Bethsaida. means the house of fish. The house of fish. And that's pretty obvious, because most of the people there were fishermen on the Sea of Galilee. It was the birth home of Peter, John, Philip and Andrew. It's the place where they were born. You can look at John 1, 44, John 12, 21 for the references, references to that. The blind man was healed there, recorded for us in Mark 8, 22 to 26. The disciples were sent here after the feeding of the 5,000. We're talking about Bethsaida now. That's covered in Mark 6, verse 45. And it was Jesus' place of retreat. And that's recorded for us in Luke chapter 9, verse 10. That's Bethsaida. Capernaum is a bigger place and more things happen there. Capernaum means the village of comfort or comfortable village. It was named after the prophet Naum, who means comforter or consolation. Herod Antipas had a military garrison there. It was a big town, a big city. The chosen home of Peter, Andrew, James, John and Matthew the tax collector who had his tax collector's office there. Jesus came here straight after the wedding of Cana in John 2 verse 12. It's the home of the nobleman whose servant was healed in John 4 46. Jesus made it his headquarters. Matthew 4 verse 12 to 13. Matthew 9 verse 1 and Luke 4 chapter 23. Jesus regularly preached in the synagogue there and at one time he cast out a demon from someone in that synagogue. Matthew 8, 14 to 15, Mark 1, 21 to 27 and Luke 4, 31 to 37. Number 7, Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law here. Mark Chapter 1, verse 30 and 31, and Luke 4, 38 and 39. Jesus healed the palsied man here, the man sick of the palsy. Matthew 9, verses 1 to 8. The sermon of the bread of life was preached here. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. That was here at Capernaum. John 6, 16 to 59. The paralytic was healed here. Do you remember when they, they broke open the, the roof in Peter's house? and lower the paralytic down on his pallet. That was here in Capernaum. Mark 2, verse 1 and two, 1 to 12. And the shekel that was in the fish, remember? Jesus told Peter to cast this fish, and in it you'll find a shekel to pay the tax. That was here. That's Matthew 17, verse 24 to 27. And a dispute over who was the greatest disciple happened here. <laughs> I'm better than you. No, I'm better than you. I'm closer to Jesus. And that happened here. That's Mark 9, verse 33 to 37. Why exactly Jesus picked out these three places, I don't know. Because there were many cities that rejected him. Many cities that ignored his teaching and were lost in their sin. But Jesus here, maybe because it was the home of so many of his disciples... Maybe it was causing the disciples so much distress that their family and friends and workmates had not come to faith in Jesus. That Jesus takes this opportunity to challenge them 
as only Jesus can. But when you consider how much time and ministry, just in those few things that I've read here to you, that happened in those places or around those particular places, when you think of the time and the ministry that Jesus poured in to this area, we can begin to understand as we read in Matthew 11 verse 20 why Jesus said what he said. And what did he say? Then he began to upbraid the cities where in most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. They were happy with the status quo. And you know, many of our family can be. They like where they are. They like how things are. They don't like change maybe. They don't want to be challenged in their life. And when we bring the truth of the gospel, it can be an offence. It's a stumbling block. It's a challenge to the status quo. It's a challenge to the sinful nature. And it's meant to be. It's meant to be an offence. It's meant to be a challenge. It's meant to produce a reaction, either to accept or to reject. There comes a time when we've witnessed so much, we've challenged so much ourselves, we've bought so much maybe of the Word of God, shown them DVDs, given them CDs to listen to, or whatever. It still seems to have no effect. That's when Jesus says, take a step back. Concentrate on what, you, what I put you here to do. Preach the word. Witness. Go out and witness outside this area and let me do my work. Turn with me to John 16, if you will. John 16. Verses 7 to 11. Jesus told the disciples that he was going away. He had to leave them. And he says in verse 6, But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and righteousness and of judgment, of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go unto my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall not glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father of the mine, therefore said I, that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. But a little while you shall not see me again, a little while and you shall see me, because I go to the Father. Jesus had to go. He had to go to fulfill prophecy. He had to go so that we could know redemption of sin. He had to go so that we could be redeemed, so that we could be cleansed. But in going, he sent another who would not just teach us all truth, but would reprove the world of sin. And that's exactly what Jesus was doing when he sent the twelve away. He was giving us a picture of what is accomplished when we allow God to do his work through his word in the lives of others. We are not here to be harvesters. We are here as sowers of the seed. We sow it. 
we sow the seed of the word, which is either the spoken word from the Bible, or it's the word of God living in us through our testimony. That's the seed. And that seed is sown into other lives through their ears, through their eyes. But you know, we can't bring them to Christ. That's not our job. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. He will judge. He will chastise. He will rebuke. He will convict. He will challenge. If we allow him. If we give him room. That doesn't mean to say we can't continue to pray. Because God will work through our prayer. But we have to give room for him to work. To do his work. Which is to reprove the world of sin. Of righteousness. Judgment. And sin. It's the work of the Holy Spirit to convict, not us. Remember what Jesus said, no man comes to the Father except through me. And no man can come to me except the Father draw him. You know, we can work so hard sometimes trying to bring people to Christ. And sometimes we can be getting in the Lord's way. Not giving him time and room to move by his Spirit through those things that we have sown into their lives. Sometimes we can be too close and they need to hear the truth from another stranger maybe. Sometimes that happens. We knew someone way back just after we were saved who had witnessed to her mother for 30 years and she'd never got saved. And I was sitting in the house once and a local pastor came in and he happened to be talking to this elderly lady and he said, isn't it about time you got saved? Isn't it about time you repented of your sin and accepted Jesus as Lord of your life? And she suddenly said, yes, I think it is. These things, you see, if we allow the Lord to do his work, wonderful are his ways. He does move in mysterious ways, far beyond our understanding. But sometimes we need to give him room and give him space to work. Remember also that Jesus himself said, a prophet is not without honour except in his own town. Jesus wasn't accepted in Nazareth. He was rejected as a prophet because they knew him. They knew him as a boy. They knew his family or his earthly family. Do you see? The people around us know us too well. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. But they can know you too well. So, bringing this all together to close I want you to turn with me to Matthew 10 once again Matthew 10 verses 11 to 15 this is something that Jesus said right at the almost right at the end of his instruction to the disciples Ten verse eleven. And into whatever city or town you shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till you go hence. And when you come into a house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whomsoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart out of that house or city, Shake off the dust of your feet. For verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. 
Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and they will scourge you in their synagogues. I'm not going to read any more. But I want you to turn now to what Jesus said at the end of chapter 11. Not quite at the end. Verse 21. See if this sounds familiar to you. Woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. That is a result of rejecting the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus made that plain to the cities of the disciples without them being there. Our responsibility, brothers and sisters, is to sow the seed, to share the word, to share our testimony to others. What they do with that is not your responsibility. What they do with that, whether they accept or reject, if they re- accept, we can rejoice with them. If they reject, that should not be a burden to you. It was never meant to be. Because then, when the seed has been sown, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. But ultimately, they have a choice whether to accept or reject Jesus. The consequences are plain. Jesus made the consequences plain to the disciples when they went out, who would reject. And Jesus made it plain to the cities of the disciples. Just as the Holy Spirit will make it plain to those to whom you are witnessing, they will know the truth and if they accept the truth will set them free if not they'll be condemned with this world but that is not your responsibility we can pray but we have to allow God time and room to work in the ones we are witnessing to can you see that because it's his work The consequences of their decision is not your concern. If they reject the truth, shake the dust from your feet. I know it's hard. I know it's hard. But sometimes we need to leave off, to depart and allow the Lord to do his work in their lives. Give him time. And let the Holy Spirit convict you. It's the work of the Holy Spirit, as we read earlier. It's his ministry here on earth. To convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. Of sin because the world rejects him. Of righteousness because Jesus is now with the Father. Of judgment because the God of this world is already judged. Sometimes we need to step away. Sometimes we need to be sent away by the Lord to be distracted in other places while the Lord does his work in those whom we cherish, we love and want to see come to him. 
Let's give the Lord time and room to work. Amen. God bless you.